Good evening. I'm Melissa Walther. Tonight, my guests are Cherie and Tom Eckert. Thousands of individuals in Oregon suffer from depression. It's important that we do everything we can to help them. Tonight, we're going to talk about the psilocybin initiative. Cherie, Tom, when did you start this, the idea for this initiative? When did this idea begin? Yeah, it goes back a little ways now. So I would say 2015, uh, we started considering this potential. And I think it's just important right off the bat to kind of talk about uh, the inspiration behind it. Certainly, we wanted to address the mental health issues and crisis here in Oregon. Um, and there's a lot of uh, research and um, uh, studies behind uh, psilocybin being used as a therapeutic tool uh, at places like Johns Hopkins and UCLA and NYU and various uh, great universities around the uh, world. And so we had an eye on that. Um, but we also were thinking about a ballot initiative in particular because we had an, a kind of a vision of where this should fit in in the culture, wouldn't you say, into mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't quite fit a purely medical uh, kind of model where it would kind of fall into the pharma world, which is where the FDA process would take it through the research that's happening. So we started uh, having dialogue around that, and we felt very passionate about it. Uh, we're therapists, so uh, that aspect is, is important to us. We see clients day in and day out who suffer and need a transformation, and it's not easy to do uh, via typical channels, talk therapy and whatnot, and uh, the uh, pharma approach is lacking in our opinion. Works for a lot of people, but not for everybody. Um, so we were looking for a kind of breakthrough modality, and that's what we find with psilocybin-assisted therapy, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we considered is that there has not been any new, as Tom said, mm -hmm. breakthroughs in psychiatry probably for about three decades. Mm -hmm. So we were really kind of looking at what can we do as individuals, as therapists, to help generate something, a plan, a modality that would work to alleviate the suffering that human beings are experiencing. Um, we'd love to see it worldwide, but you got to start somewhere. So. Oregon was our, our choice. And it makes sense because there is uh, a crisis here. Uh, the mental health issues in Oregon, the rates of uh, mental illness are higher here than anywhere in the country. Um, so the conventional paths have led us here, and that looks like crisis to me. Uh, so well, it's been declared crisis by our governor. Yes, it has. So I think that um, there's serious problems in this state and there's a potential solution not a panacea but it is a solution that has been proven to be effective in the clinical studies and we think that bringing it to the people via the ballot initiative is the right way to do it because it allows for things to unfold differently versus a FDA which is the purely medical modality the insurance model, um, the pharma way of looking at things. This is more community-based, and it's more of a compassionate care orientation. So I think that the initiative that we drafted, and then we've had a lot of help, and we could talk about that in a minute, um, addresses both the mental health and addiction crisis, as well as the desire to approach psychology and psychiatry in a more human way. Yeah, I really like that last point. Um, so this is therapy. It's not legalization or decriminalization where uh, people are using at home. Um, and we can talk about that. Um, there are arguments that uh, the penalties are too high for psilocybin. We agree with that. But that's kind of another issue that we can get in. Um, this. Uh, language focuses on creating access to psilocybin assisted therapy and what that means is that it's not just the psilocybin itself it's a therapeutic process and that involves uh, preparation beforehand it involves administration of psilocybin uh, under the supervision of a, a licensed facilitator um, 
and it involves, importantly, integration afterwards. So uh, talking through the impact or the um, insights, epiphanies, emotional breakthroughs, those kind of things, uh, how they can affect your uh, momentum moving forward, how you can integrate this big, profound experience into your life and make real change. And so the, the research is about that modality. It's not about psilocybin by itself. It's about optimizing the experience in a therapeutic container. And when you do that, the uh, outcomes are pretty startling. There's uh, great success with, like you said, depression, and uh, especially hard to treat depression. Depression where other um, uh, therapies and uh, interventions have not worked. Uh, psilocybin breaks through with uh, uh, surprising frequency. Again, it's not a panacea. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's statistically uh, impressive, however. Uh, PTSD, you know, addictions, even cigarette smoking. Um, okay. So back to the, uh, when did we start and how, why did we do it this way? Um, to Tom's point, we were following the clinical studies and uh, trials and we were asking ourselves as therapists, as clinicians, when you're working with somebody who comes in and they're on traditional pharmaceuticals, SSRIs and things of that nature, it takes a long time to help them have a breakthrough if we even achieve an, an actual cathartic breakthrough. And so as we were looking, I think, at the yeah. studies and whatnot, we, could, we were questioning, you know, is this something that could actually come into the therapy process and make it go a little bit faster um, so that the person can have more time to enjoy their their freedom and their healthy mindset. Yeah. And I don't think SSRIs, I mean, this is, uh, it's a you could have a debate pharma. around this, but I don't think that the pharma approach really facilitates breakthroughs. Right. It, it, it uh, contains symptoms, right? It's kind of a mm -hmm. symptom suppression. And I don't mean to like just totally diss on pharma. I think that for some people it works real well, but I think there's a, uh, a lot of overdiagnosis, a lot of overprescription, and we're not getting to the root causes of uh, human suffering yeah. in a lot of cases. So this yeah. is a this is a intervention that's based on a different philosophy, mm -hmm. right? There's this is about uh, a healing experience. So for those who are kind of new to this, psilocybin, of course, is a, a, a um, magic mushrooms, a psychedelic experience. Uh, it, it, creates uh, an experience with under the right uh, proper guidance and, and safe setting and eliminating all uh, uh, factors that can interrupt, uh, you can really get somewhere. And so it's really about uh, activating your inner healer in a way, which is a kind of a funny thing to say, but it comes from the inside. It's, it's your, you're able to see your issues more clearly, uh, create a more a flexible state of mind in which you can take different perspectives and those insights and emotional and it also brings up emotions that you might have locked away. Um, which with traditional um, uh, psychiatric uh, pharmaceutical therapy it's meant to kind of numb you I think it, mm -hmm. it that's what our experience is when we're working with clients who are taking medication that basically numbs them down because their emotions are too intense. And so psilocybin is actually the opposite. It intensifies everything in a short period of time, but in such a free and liberating way mm -hmm. that the, the chance to have an experience that um, allows you to face what you don't want to face or gives you perspective on the things that you do want to face, that's the difference. So you're, as your own inner therapist, your own guru, so to say, you are able to, in a short period of time, look at self and, and give yourself what you need to heal yourself uh, versus um, long-term talk, long talk therapy, which I, I think is also very healthy. I, I think therapy is a great thing, but in hard to treat depression and um, addictions, I think this is a really good uh, potential Actually, it's just a really good solution for a lot of people, but again, not for everybody. Mm -hmm. So you've been gathering the 
research on this for years. This mm -hmm. is not a new concept yeah. at all. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Let's really dig into the, the, the nitty gritty of what this bill will do. Yeah. Now, the last time we spoke, yeah. we were uh, talking a little bit about there was some language changes, and I, I want to hear uh, what those changes mm -hmm. are bringing to this mm -hmm. initiative. Yeah, it's a really interesting time to meet up. I'm not sure when this will be airing, but at the moment that we're talking, we are uh, just at the tail end of a process of having revised the language and getting a new ballot title. So there's, uh, of course, questions, okay, what does that mean? Why are we touching the language? Well, we've improved it in a lot of ways, and there's kind of a story behind it. I guess we have time to kind of dig into what the process has been. Um, going back a few months, uh, we were... Um, a few things happened kind of simultaneously. One, we got approached by a, a, a legal team that's very uh, pro what we're doing and uh, believes in the uh, therapeutic modality, uh, but had some questions about the language itself, uh, specifically in regard to what would happen when it passes. And they were, from a legal perspective, concerned about the Oregon Health Authority being able to roll this out without undue issues uh, because it is a Schedule One drug federally and so and um, there's no poll memorandum uh, like with cannabis cannabis when it was passed measure 91 it the state has the the protection from the federal government via the coal memorandum and for psilocybin it, that's something that we're going to have to develop as a state yeah. so it was it was part of the motivation to change the language was to ensure that we allowed the Oregon Health Authority and the advisory boards that are established via the ballot initiative to have a developmental period of two years so that they could have greater success at, during the implementation mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Emerge Law kind of threw that at us and we we're a little resistant, you know, it's like I didn't really want to go back and tinker with things but they were making a lot of sense so we were considering that. Then we, um, around that time we connected with um, David Bronner and, and, and Bronner's Magic Soaps, who many of you have probably heard about. It's a really amazing activist company, probably use their soap. Um, mm -hmm. But what you, might not, what you might not know about Bronner's is that they're tremendously active, give away their 40% uh, of their profits and are behind a lot of amazing causes and are also leaders in the world with regard to regenerative farming and the way they create their soap is like perfectly uh, environmental, environmentally, not only environmentally friendly, but sets the, the path for the future in my opinion. Wonderful company. Anyway, David Bronner uh, connected with us. We uh, started collaborating, talking, um, and so we ran it by them. Like, what do you guys think about this language? Uh, should we step back and revise it? And they agreed that we should, and at the same time, we talked to uh, the, the DPA, the DPA, yeah. the Drug Policy Alliance. So one of the core changes is that the Measure 12 had a decriminalization of psilocybin in it, and Measure Number 34 does not. And the reason for that is because after consulting and um, conversing with the legal staff at DPA, we discovered that they are investigating and doing uh, a bunch of polls and research to possibly, and we're hoping this will happen, do decriminalization Portugal style here in Oregon in 2020. Wow. And so that's what they're working on right now. We should probably have some information more towards whether that's going to happen in 2020 or not towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But that really motivated Tom and I to think about uh, they, they made some comments and it made sense to us that why just psilocybin when it impacts the very, very minimal amount of people in our state? Why just psilocybin? What kind of message does that send? It kind of doesn't go far enough, right? You're right. It doesn't go far enough. Yeah. And so the, the conversation was one that it, it helped us kind of see things a little differently. And then there's the, the whole financial aspect. I think we should maybe it, step yeah. back and clarify a little bit. So the first bill had two separate parts. One was legalizing access to psilocybin therapy. So that's a whole framework to create licenses and, and, and regulations around uh, how to have uh, 
psilocybin therapy legalized with the code of ethics and practice standards and things like that. So that's one area. And then the other piece was uh, bringing penalties? down the penalties for p common possession of psilocybin. We didn't think anyone should be arrested, lose their job, uh, et cetera, for picking a mushroom out of the ground, right? It's uh, kind of absurd. Um, so we put that in there because we could, right? Um, although our focus has always been on the therapeutic use. Right? And then when we started talking to the Drug Policy Alliance, and this is a, a, a um, driving force between, behind a lot of the cannabis legislation across the country, um, the, they're the bellwether of drug policy reform in the United States of America, uh, and the world probably. Um, and they reached out to us, essentially asking us, what do you think about dropping the decrim because we would like to have a clear playing field to come in and potentially uh, do a ballot initiative to uh, do um, comprehensive drug policy reform in Oregon, which was like, wow. And so when you start talking on that level, you know, they're, they're dealing with broader issues like Shreve mentioned, right? They're dealing with, their, <coughs> their mission is more about reducing incarceration and how the drug laws affect communities of color, things of that nature. And so we're, in taking that in, thinking about, you know, decriminalizing psilocybin itself, which really doesn't lead to a lot of arrests and doesn't, uh, affect c different communities in, in those kind of ways. Nor does it well, establish c compassionate care after the fact. So if you decriminalize psilocybin, for instance, yes, you're not going to go to jail. But you're not going to <coughs> implement necessarily um, compassionate care afterwards. So what do we do when somebody is arrested for um, driving while they're on psilocybin? Uh, in Portugal, what they did is they said, if we decriminalize all of these drugs, now the money that we would be spending to incarcerate individuals, we can spend that money on helping these people to re rehabilitate pretty much. And not that we need that with psilocybin, because like we've said, it's such a small um, aspect in terms of arrest and incarceration. But in general, what, what the goal is, is to not put people in prison, but to help them figure out why they're using drugs and why they're actually abusing drugs. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between using and abusing. I think that um, what speaking with the DPA allowed us to do was to focus on what we know best, which is the therapeutic access, yeah. <coughs> and allow the, the DPA, who really knows what they're doing, to kind of pull up that side of it. So that led to dropping the decrim side of our initiative and in hopes of um, forwarding ballot initiatives in 2020 that legalize psilocybin-assisted therapy and comprehensive decrim uh, kind of side by side. And that is a template for not only Oregon, but I think for the country and the world. Uh, so we think that's something to get behind. Um, and it frees us up to focus on, on this uh, uh, potential of, of psilocybin assisted therapy here in here in Oregon. So the the two probably major changes in the initiative and the heart of the initiative remains the same. Mm -hmm. We've always been about the therapeutic aspect mm -hmm. of the initiative, but I, I think the two biggest changes are the, the removing decriminalization and adding this two year implementation period by creating um, an advisory board that's actually written into the law. So the OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, would have to create a, a, a board that is very diverse, that ha does have the skill sets, both politically, uh, medically, uh, botanically, ther you know, in every way to actually make this happen. And so I'd say that's the, the, the gist of the change. Those are the biggest changes for sure. Um, and we got to go in so, since we made the big decision to, okay, we're going to look at this again. We were able to go in there and tighten up little things that uh, we realized could have been better. Uh, for example, you know, there's a good amount of discussion as to whether creating this framework would allow kind of corporatization or 
uh, kind of exploitation yeah. from pharma. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And with this new revision, there's absolutely zero room. Uh, and just as a simple example, uh, with regard to the production of psilocybin that people worry about kind of being taken over by pharma, well, we just wrote into the initiative that uh, no one's going to own more than one uh, production, no entity will own more than one pr production facility of, of limited size. So uh, there's no incentive for big corporations to get into this game. Mm -hmm. And it's based on residency, it's homegrown. Uh, on the service side where you have access to what we call psilocybin service centers, which are where you would go, actual facilities where you could go. Um, nobody can own more f than five of those, so no big chains can corner the market. So stuff like that. We really um, dialed in uh, the and protected the spirit of what we're trying to do. And so, uh, you know, that's an important thing to, to get out there because I think this is a nuanced bill and people get confused and when they get confused they tend to assume things that aren't true you know people are kind of cynical yeah, in general I mean I know I am um, <laughs> so it's really important to get get it out there that this is actually a pure bill it's meant for the people to take care of each other and you know, get outside of the medical frame but at the same time incorporate discipline uh, best practice standards safety uh, code of ethics, you know. I mean, that's really the main thing about having a regulatory frame, is that if somebody's abusing it, there's somebody to com somebody to lodge a complaint to. You know, that's what it's about. Like, uh, Shuri and I have a private practice, and we're licensed to do that. The state doesn't run our private practice. You know, they they they're just over there. You know, and that's what it's going to be like with this. So I think. But that exists to protect the individuals yeah, that come to us. So, as Tom said, if they're if they're unhappy with their services because they feel there's been neglect or wrongful actions, they've got a governing body to go to and say, "Listen, I had this experience," and then the board has to take that up with the the therapist. When we hear about the things that are happening um, worldwide and various different retreats and and things of that nature with entheogenic medicines, we are discovering that there is abuse and there is danger and there's even been, you know, harm. And so this bill basically says we are going to ensure that that doesn't happen to the best of our ability. And we're going to, yeah, and we're going to bring the underground above ground and give it a chance to uh, uh, be out in the open and mm -hmm. to do it intelligently. That's, we can do this, right? Well, that's it. That's the changes. <laughs> that's the changes, I think. Yeah. So for our viewers who haven't uh, joined us for our previous chat, and you should join us for our previous chat, uh, it's quite good, although we were missing Sheree. Mm -hmm. It's very good to have you. Thank you. Uh, someone with depression or PTSD or one of the other conditions that can be assisted by psilocybin, once this is passed, what would their new reality look like? Instead of just the traditional, here have a daily medical regimen that you have mm -hmm. to swallow once a day, mm -hmm. or you have to you know, arrange your schedule in such a way. How, how will this change the life of everyday Oregonians who are suffering? Well, that's a good question, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that to start with, it will give them hope. Because while, again, this doesn't work for everybody, it does give them the chance to go in and find out, can this be good for me? Would this be helpful for me to help me with my addiction, to help me with this clinical depression that I've had for 20 years and can't seem to move past? So I think first and foremost, the citizens of Oregon would be looking at something new. I have an aunt, I have an uncle, I have a mother, a child who's struggling. And this might be the answer. So hope goes a long way if there's something to be hopeful for. Yes. So this is offering a, a type of assistance that could truly clinically alleviate whatever it is you're struggling with. I think that's one thing that we would see different. When hope raises in a person, the community that is hopeful starting with the family nuclei, the individual, then the family, then, then the community, it changes the way that we interact with one another. 
just the hope does. As long as it's hope based on reality, it's good hope, right? And this is something that would, as you say, if passed, could be a reality for many people in this state. I think that, yeah, the hope is valid uh, because of the outcomes. You know, I think that uh, it's significant in terms of the impact it makes uh, with these issues. Um, so what does that mean to uh, an Oregonian who's been stuck? It means getting unstuck, you know? Um, so, you know, again, psilocybin works in such a way that it, uh, in one shot sometimes, releases some of these stuck patterns of thinking, uh, of emotion, behavior, and that's what psilocybin is good for, okay? So in other words, like kind of philosophically, when you look at mental health issues, there's a couple different varieties. One is the kind of um, getting stuck variety, and one is being too open variety. Okay, so psychosis is too open. You're connecting things that other people don't connect. You're not grounded in the kind of uh, shared experience of the community, and so that becomes a problem with adaptation and things of that nature. Psilocybin is not the answer for that, because what psilocybin does is it promotes openness. Okay, so if you're already too open, this is not uh, your intervention. And this is why assessment and some regulation is key, because you know part of the process of this, this therapy is uh, ascertaining if this is the right intervention for you. Now, that being said, there's a whole spectrum of mental health issues that are on the other side where you're stuck. Okay, so what does that mean? It means uh, repetitive cycles of negative thinking about self, about the future, that's depression. Uh, addictions, a kind of cycle of negative thinking as well as pattern behavior, um, OCD, PTSD. Well, these all kind of yeah. fall in that bucket. So psilocybin uh, helps these individuals to have an experience that at once deactivates that part of the brain, quite literally, and this is shown in uh, the fMRI studies at Imperial College of London and other places, uh, where that part of the brain that's become overactive and got you in cycles is basically turned off during the psilocybin experience. So you get a reprieve from that during the experience, and it also activates these kind of deeper regions of the brain and gets them talking to each other in this kind of unusual way. And sometimes that bubbles up into a full-out kind of mystical experience, okay? And so that's all well and good in the container of the experience itself, but the real breakthrough here is the impact of that experience afterwards. Okay, so uh, I've heard it like an analogy of if you're climbing a mountain and you're, you know what your goal is and you see the peak of the mountain up there, beautiful, you know what you're doing, you know your purpose, right? But then the clouds come down and it's gray and you no longer see that peak and it's just drudgery, you know, it becomes drudgery day after day and you forget what it's all about. You know, you lose the beauty that was your mission. Um, psilocybin, in a sense, comes in and opens that up again, and you see the peak again. And you have a big experience, profound experience, right? Now, you come off psilocybin, those clouds are going to come back, but you remember. You remember why you were here, right? You get centered again. And I thought that was a good analogy to kind of put it in, is proper context. It doesn't just solve everything by itself, but it gives you a uh, perspective and an openness and a reconnection uh, to, to your vital energy again. But then it's up to you to work with the therapist or in other ways to, to uh, make that part of your life because otherwise it just becomes a memory. And that's why recreational use is different than therapeutic use. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So that's the individual. You asked, how is this going to make a person's life look different? Now imagine that person 
who's experienced this openness and this reconnectivity to inner self and to true self and multiply that by the hundreds of thousands who are suffering in this state of for, with mental health crisis and addictions and imagine that these people are able to have this experience because they qualify and now you've got not only this crosstalk in your own brain where you're connecting everything and it's all starting to make sense and you're able to work through your struggles afterwards so that you're continually growing and then other people are doing it and then other people are doing it imagine how that will change society so it's one person's self-improvement multiplied by tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands will absolutely impact and change our society and this is the hope this is the big hope this is mm -hmm. the re the reality the real change the real healing the real possibility and um, mm -hmm. I think that's th the vision we can hold for our our human landscape for our eco earth Gaia landscape for our spiritual landscape I think that when we are healed on the inside when we're connected with self it's easier for me to connect with you and you to connect with Tom and us to share this humbleness that we discover in our frailty and yet this an intense personal power that we discover through this experience of strength and the ability to work through our struggles. That's, that's how I see it. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You mentioned if you qualify. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit because you've mentioned again that this is not about decriminalization. This is about creating a framework mm -hmm. so that this is done safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. How does so, somebody get to that point? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, again, it's important to get the nuance and to get the right word in there. I think it's therapeutic rather than medical or decriminalized. You know, mm -hmm. I, and I say that because it's not based on having a mental health condition. You can access these services uh, uh, as long as you don't have contraindications, like I mentioned. Uh, you can access them for personal growth, for other for just getting connected again. Uh, well, because I don't think that, di you know, mental health is so rigidly diagnosable. I think it's a spectrum of stuff that, you know, we've, we've kind of forked it over to the medical model where we jot down diagnoses and stuff like that. But first and foremost, we're human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what this is returning to. It's that human energy uh, th and that healing power that's within us. Yeah, so let, let's talk about what contraindication is. Okay, so when we say qualifying, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is we want to make sure you're going to be safe, mm -hmm. physically and mentally. So as Tom shared earlier, if you are struggling with psychosis or schizophrenia, this is not your medicine. This is not going to help that specific diagnosis. Also, if you're on certain medications, because the psilocybin does impact our physiology, so some medications um, actually slow your heart rate down and things of that nature. That's important to know because then again this might not be the medicine for you. So when you think about what's happening in the clinical studies, these are sick people, right? People diagnosed with cancer, people who are having chemotherapy, people who are on various different medications, but they've been, it's been determined that those medications are not going to contraindicate their experience with psilocybin. And so that's what we're talking about in terms of yeah. qualification. We just want to make sure through a, a, a general risk assessment that they would have during that first um, yeah. interview with their facilitator, what's your life experience, what's your health, physically, emotionally, psychologically, because this is what's going to help the licensed, the trained and licensed facilitator to help you make the best decision for your well-being because ultimately it is your decision and what we're providing is the tool and the opportunity for you to come and make a decision of is this what's going to possibly 
work for me? And what are the potential challenges? And what, uh, what can I um, hopefully see as an outcome? And what are the real risks in terms of contraindication? And the facilitators will be well trained in that regard. So the right. facilitators become licensed. So th another way that this isn't kind of based on other models is that these are standalone licensees. So uh, y it's not like you get ushered in because you're a psychiatrist. Anyone can do the training and become a psychedelic or a psilocybin facilitator. This is specific knowledge. It's it's the ability to. Uh, help people understand what those contraindications are, help them understand uh, the flow of the experience, things of that nature. Um, yeah, but otherwise it's, it's, you know, we're trying to open it up as much as possible and be safe. And by open it up, I don't mean open it up to home use and things like that, but within a safe therapeutic container. The more people who are curious who can access this experience, you know, outside of the public guy, and, and the better, you know. So um, we're not trying like to push it on anyone, but it should be available if you are curious about finding out what this is about. Because it is actually, despite our focus on contraindications, which is super important, psilocybin is actually very uh, gentle on the body. It works, it's not toxic. It works uh, very well. With, it moves through the body very easily. So there's not a lot of undue risk as long as you are understanding, you know, Fresh medication you complications. On it. <laughs> yeah, there's no way to, people do not overdose on they psilocybin. They addicted to it. You can't eat enough mushrooms to, you know, it's like the, yeah. it's, there's no yeah. toxicity right. um, in that respect. But that being said, it's a very profound and vulnerable psychological experience, right? Uh, and it can go wrong if it's, you're in the wrong setting, you know, if you're... Um, out in public and you know people have trouble at festivals and things like that because it's not necessarily the right setting to be doing this not to say you can't have a wonderful experience that way but there's more chance that things are going to go sideways when you optimize everything uh, you may have a challenging experience and and if you're a, uh, struggling with mental health issues you may very well have a challenging experience because kind of a therapeutic uh, truism is that in order to uh, heal, you have to go in to the pain, right? Because a lot of the symptoms we see are of avoidance, right? Like addiction is avoiding that thing that you don't want to deal with, so you go get uh, high, right? So this is a, a, a uh, intervention that is helping you to face the things that you may not want to face, and so that may be challenging, but you come through it, and that's the therapeutic process. So it's not always like rainbows and unicorns, right? <laughs> but I think we yeah. should also point out at this time, cause, because the initiative isn't just for depressed or people who have addictions. It is for anyone over 21 mm -hmm. who has been cleared of contraindications for any reason. So if you are 21, 22, and you, you feel stuck, perhaps in career direction or something, you know? You, you can come and speak with a, a trained facilitator and say, you know what, I'd like to do this because I'd like to explore my own mind, maybe get a better grip on what it is that I want to do with my future. If you're 70 and you know that your time is wrapping up here on Earth and you just want to feel peace about it, have a little bit of existential anxiety, this is an opportunity for you to come and explore that within yourself, what your fear is, what your hope is. So this isn't just for people who are depressed or people who um, are suffering with mental health c problems. It's, it's for anybody as long as they're qualified. And I think that's important. I really do. Uh, we had Paul Stamets speak with us last year on uh, at the Newmark, and by the way, we're having him speak again this year at the Newmark on 920. Um, and he had mentioned one of the surveys that was done that spoke ab uh, about violence, and do domestic violence in particular, and how psilocybin, the men who t participated in this study, how it was shown that men who had taken, was it psilocybin or psychedelics in general? 
I think it was specifically psilocybin. Yeah, psilocybin. Yeah, that they had significantly less violence in their personal and interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. because of the fact that they had um, c they had used psilocybin. Well, it's correlations. A, you know, they looked at like a hundred thousand people, and it's correlated. Psychedelic use is correlated with a lot of you know pro-social measures. You know, yeah, less peace. domestic violence, <laughs> less, and you know, so you can't really prove causation there, but there's a lot of correlation uh, in these kind of broad uh, inventory studies. Which I think is significant, and it's worthy of talking about, and it's worthy of looking at. And one of the amazing things, if we um, really look at all the possible outcomes of this initiative, when it passes, one of the spectacular things that Oregon can do as a, a state is we can start doing a lot of different research. So right now the research is very, very limited. It's very specific. FDA is just like tight. You you have to have exact parameters, um, use a specific medicine, like it, it all has to be the same. Specific diagnoses, diagnoses. ruling everyone else yeah. out. You know, so that's the medical model. Right? Imagine Oregon being the one who says, okay, we've got these facilities now, we might even have some hospitals, I would like to challenge Oregon Health Science University to think about the potential that they could have as a learning uh, hospital and a, and a school to actually do some research and find out what are all the possibilities. What are what are there more things that we should learn in terms of, of uh, care and risk? I think they could speak with uh, Robin Carhart Harris over at Imperial College of London because they've been doing a lot of research and discovering a lot. We could There's be so many the, things. The what about like the epicenter? What about Alzheimer's, neurogenesis? Yeah. There's preliminary studies that show that psilocybin uh, increases connectivity in the brain and creates new pathways, not just during the experience, but like neurogenesis. Right. You know, so right. and we there's just so much we don't know. Right. And we need to find out. And, and we could be the state to do that. Yeah. And so this is a this travesty is that for fifty years you know, not too long ago, we didn't know what goes on in the brain on a psychedelic. You know, even though all the technology had advanced so mm -hmm. far with fMRIs and all that, and we're not allowed to look at this part. You know, the most interesting substance uh, in terms of consciousness on the planet, and we're not looking at it through an fMRI. Well, that's changed. Now mm -hmm. we're starting to learn, but there's so much. We're so behind. You know, there's so much more to learn. Um, but that, you know, it, it doesn't. The key thing is safety, right? And we've proven safety. That's phase one of of the FDA process. Is you have to prove it's safe right. in this kind of context of you know the therapeutic channel. And so from there, I, I see no reason why we shouldn't explore what's possible. And yeah, I agree. So as you can tell, I, I can see that we're coming to the final part of this uh, conversation. But there's so much to be experienced and hoped for with this initiative in terms of healing, in terms of changing homes, and then communities, and then our state, and ultimately humanity. Not because it is a panacea, and we just really have to emphasize that, but because Let's say 25% of those that are, are on um, pharma medication right now and having no success in changing their life, or those who have addiction, let's just say 25% find change. That's a huge, huge impact on mm. this state. Saves lives. It saves lives. For sure. it, it begins to change the fabric of society. And I don't think that's grandiose. I don't think that I'm just making something up. I think that when we see well, individuals walk out of our private office and we see them change, we know they're going home and they're going to be a part of a unit and everything touches everything in the family and in the community. And we know that their personal change is going to impact their family. It's going to impact their children and their marriage. It's going to impact the way that they the dynamics with their mother and father and siblings. Why shouldn't we expect the very same thing with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I yeah, I, I like your phrase, changing the fabric of society. I think that obviously that's a, we like to use the catchphrase, real healing, real change, right? 
So real healing on an individual level, taking that home to their families, like they're saying, and then real change on a cultural level by accepting this way of approaching healing, which assumes uh, something that's lost in the medical system. Yeah. It assumes yeah. empowerment. It assumes uh, that you have resources within yourself to open up, right? Instead of, here, be quiet, I'm handing you a pill, the answer is coming from the outside. I do realize you're ingesting psilocybin to get there, but it really does activate a conscious experience that allows you to work with it and, and come to some new conclusions yourself. And I think that's why this is kind of catching fire culturally, you know, the, because it represents something. It represents an empowerment uh, in a Personal system power. that is kind of taken that empowerment away in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. And, well, uh, they certainly put it into law and it, uh, the, the system, right? You know, you, you can do this with your mind and yeah, you can do this with your body, but you can't do this with your mind and you can't do this with your body. Even though it's safe, that's the crazy yeah. thing. Um, so that's got to change. I mean, it's safe and it's just law based on taboo right now. Like, why is it there? Well, because mm -hmm. someone has to change it, so that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Change is scary. And but we find that, you know, that's a, that's the truth. Change can be scary. But if we can lay this out in a clear way so that the public can understand that this change, while it may be unfamiliar, does not have to be scary. Because we can show you science and we can show you the statistics and the efficacy. We can show you the modality even. There's just so much information to support the initiative. And we can uh, prove in that language that there, this is not about corporations or people taking over a new space. Mm -hmm. That is not happening with this language. You know, that narrative is false. That is a false And narrative. it's right there in the language. Read it. Uh, I know it's a lot to read, but don't listen to Facebook discussions. Read the language <laughs> and <laughs> talk about what's in there. You know? There's something that I wanted to touch on before we wrapped up. Uh, yeah. The misconceptions that sh you may see out there. Would you like to shoot a couple of them down while we have yeah, an I audience? Yeah, I mean that's what we're doing. Pretty, pretty straightforward right now. And I think that uh, that I hope we're impressing. I don't want to kind of be in opposition. I just want to impress upon people that this is a very pure movement. You know, it's coming from a pure space. Mm -hmm. Shri, and I, Shri and I are not uh, getting paid for any of this you know we're just simple we've never counselors been paid yeah for this that might be one thing to share with the public is we've in the entire time that we've been doing this we've only supported ourselves from our own professional um, we keep it afloat work. somehow and so we've never taken any money from the the campaign and that uh, we don't have intentions you know like to have a regular salary or anything like that we've been really um, careful to be able to let the public know this is about you this isn't about us so and then in terms of corporatizing as you've yeah, said this spirit like we are the farthest thing away from corporate influence <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> counselors people and <laughs> so so we are with you that we want to protect the spirit of what we're doing here and we've done that painstakingly that's why the uh, the initiative is detailed is mostly because we're putting walls around things so that they don't get contaminated uh, and I well, think we've done that really yeah, well. I think um, so too and I think the public should know that because we, we use the words a regulatory framework, yeah, it doesn't mean that we're taking away State freedom. Day, oh, right, it doesn't mean that we are we are creating this like gatekeeper kind of thing. That's not what it means at all. Basically we're saying as therapists we understand that you're in a vulnerable state of mind. It's different than cannabis. It's, it, it's something that needs a little bit more care. And it's not about gatekeeping. It's about caring about you. And we want the individuals to have the best possible experience and to know that there's not going to be anybody driving around while they're, they're having a, a, a psilocybin experience. And that everybody can feel safe about that. So it's, it's about safety, and we shouldn't argue about safety because this, oh is not re this is not reducing anybody's ability to use psilocybin. It's just providing the medium 
in which to do it that is the safest medium for all of us. Yeah, and if it gets intelligently decriminalized, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's like, think, it's, a, it's the service part, too. It's like, uh, uh, like if you're a massage therapist, you have some board that is, is uh, regulating in some way just to make sure that there's best practice standards. But that's it. You know? Well, and I and, think also I think to your point, Tom, uh, with when you when you just uh, decriminalize, and again we support decriminalization in 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 general in concept, right? But there's no kind of like aftercare, and to see the change that we want to see in reducing the the mental health crisis and the addictions that are in our state, it's super important to to go the next step. And I think that when if we allow by this through this initiative the underground workers to come above ground and get trained, they can actually not just facilitate an experience, but they can continue to help their the people that they've worked with to keep it up to because the clouds may come back as Tom shared and you're it's okay to need continued assistance afterwards. And this is it should this be is embedded in. I mean, yeah. I think that this is an augmentation of therapy. Uh, it's for those who are in a practice of some kind, whether it's seeing a therapist or of your own practice. This is can be part of it, but it's not a replacement for. Um, yeah. So I think in terms of like setting things straight, we just want the public to know there's there's no possibility for for corporatization in this initiative. Zero. We, zero possibility. We hear uh, that a little too much. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. I guess that's what you and, asked and, for, right? And there's no, there's <laughs> no, there's no big gatekeeper thing going on. There's no. It's there, not a state a, overtaking anything. You yeah. know, right now the state has overtaken psilocybin. By the way, is like people, uh, is this too, is regulation? You know, giving. You know, right now we are at the most intense regulation you can possibly have, and we call that. It's illegal. You mm -hmm. cannot do anything with it. So we're frying it open. We're removing barriers. You know? um, so yeah. And, and we've written into the language. You know that it, uh, the Oregon Health Authority has to be re reasonable with it, the way that they price things out and the licenses mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And so people worry about, well, is this going to be really expensive? Is everybody going to have access to this? Well, that's going to depend on your facilitator. So. The ones who are going to create the price are going to be the ones who are facilitating. And I suspect that facilitators who are currently doing this, you know, wh why would they want to change the price they're currently charging? So yeah. I think that. Oh, I think that's a key point, yeah. like to what you were saying. is, um, And I, I, I understand this concern that what about price? What is it going to, you know, be too expensive? Um, what we've done to continue, we can't legislate cost, but what we can do is take it out of the medical system so it's not locked up in hospitals, only provided by medical doctors who are going to charge high rates. Uh, we, you know, we put it in the community, we put it in your hands, basically anyone can become a facilitator. Uh, we're not going to, the, the, the market won't be such that s mushrooms themselves are going to cost a lot of money. Okay, so I think people get scared because they hear about the research and how rigorous it is and how, how uh, costly the research you know, in is. order to get psilocybin through a research protocol, it's like $7,000 or something. That's because of all the red tape of the FDA. That is not going to be the way it is on the ground here. Um, you know, that being said, I think it's uh, fully legitimate to make an honest living Absolutely. doing psychedelic work, just like anything else. Uh, so it's up to us to take care of each other, uh, mm -hmm. to build in sliding scales in our practices, just like we do as therapists. Um, and it's in our hands. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, it it's the cost is going to be determined by our mindset. Are we going to be greedy, or are we going to actually be loving and caring, and yeah, I embrace one another? the way that we should as, as human beings. And so I think that while this provides us a lot of opportunity, it's going to test us also. It's going to really um, show 
what it is that we have inside of us and what we're capable of doing in terms of giving back to the community. I think there should be nonprofits that work toward providing services and raising funds to provide services. Um, but I think there'll be a, a spectrum, right? And I, I, this gets to that question about what is a facility. And it can look like any number of things as long as it's following safety standards and, and practice standards. So it could be a retreat center, it could be a small an office, it could be a whole variety of things. It could even have outdoor components. You know, this is not what is not clinical and, and sterile. That's another thing we hear a lot. Who would want to do psilocybin in a clinical environment? <laughs> well, don't make a clinical environment then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get licensed, start your retreat center, make it safe, follow the regulations, but otherwise it can do, you know, that's the exciting part. There's a marketplace of ideas that can happen to make this fly. Yeah. That excites me. Yep. <laughs> opportunity is amazing, and there's so many different types of opportunities in this. So I would just like to encourage your viewers to visit our website. You can look at the ballot there, the proposed ballot. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to encourage them to watch the many different videos that we have on our Facebook page. Hopefully you can and put website. that up afterwards and our website. Um, sign up for the email letter because mm -hmm. with that you get all the newest information that's coming out in regards to um, events and, and updates. Uh, updates and mm -hmm. things of that nature. I'd like to encourage them to also at our website and on our Facebook page to read the articles that we publish because they're, they're, um, they're informative. And the more educated we are about this as a community, the better that we will make this, dis the better able we will be to make this decision to help the people of our state yeah. to, to achieve real healing and real change. And that is, I think, what, what we're shooting for. Yeah, and just the last piece is that the campaign is all of you guys out there. You know, learn uh, what this is about, get the right information, and then ma let's make this it already is getting out there. It's becoming a kitchen table conversation. Can you imagine <laughs> we're talking about psilocybin in, as, as a real thing now? And that is so, uh, that's in, a, in an era where good news is hard to come by. This is good news. In a cynical world, it <laughs> is time for some answers, for some positive change. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much for both being here tonight. This has mm -hmm. been another wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. I know I've been inspired. I hope all of our viewers have been inspired. How do we sign our names? <laughs> How do we support this? Yep, so we are, uh, the revision process and the, the ballot titling process is, uh, as, as we shoot this, is like tomorrow. We'll uh, get to a, a final piece of that. Then there's another 10 days to get it certified. And then after that, we're hitting the streets to get the signatures. So in about two weeks from when this was filmed, um, we're going to get uh, volunteers out there, and we're also going to get a firm out there to really nail down the signatures. So between now and uh, July of 2020, you will see us out on the streets. And feel free to drop us a line uh, if you want to connect with us. And yeah, you'll be seeing a lot of us in the, in the near future. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. If you'd like more information, please check out www.psi-2020.org.